of the evening to join us, and that is going to be our friend Mark Greenfield, who was, as I said, supposed to join us last time around. Unfortunately, we got uh, bogged down in some technical issues that prevented that from happening. I will send an invite over to our friend Mark Greenfield and ask with us. Again, I thank you all in the audience for joining us here. I will send some waves out to you all while Mark is getting set up. Hello, Mark. Hi, Rodney. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. It's good to connect on Instagram with you. Yeah, it's good to connect. Unfortunately, the last time around, as I was mentioning at the top of the program, we we were just about there with the connection, but then my my app just decided it had had enough for the day and was time to take a nap. Uh, so that uh, crashed and uh, things went haywire. But I'm, I'm glad we're here and we're connected and everything is all set to go. So, uh, Mark, let me just uh, give a talk up of, of where you're coming from. Uh, again, I, I, I referenced this uh, earlier on a few minutes back. We had a uh, production here about a month and a half, two months ago, uh, an all-star production reading of A Midsummer Night's Dream from Christopher Carter Sanderson and Gorilla Rep. And for those who don't know that group, they are guys who have been innovating and presenting guerrilla theater downtown in New York and all around town uh, for 25 plus years. And Mark was the bottom in that production. He was our fantastic bottom. He did a fantastic job. And again, that content can all be found in our archives right here on the IGTV tab of our Instagram page or also on our YouTube or our Facebook channels. Uh, and Mark, beyond just being a fantastic performer and being so, so uh, adept at the clowning with bottom, Mark has had his own company that he's been running uh, pretty much uh, parallel in terms of time frame to what uh, CRISPR was doing with uh, Cr uh, Gorilla Rep. You had, uh, in, from the early 90s and onward, you had a group called the Faux Real Theater Company. Uh, why don't you tell us, Mark, about the origins of the Faux Real Theater Company? The first show we did was called Heteb Cam, which was Macbeth Backwards. <laughs> the original production was in the House of Candles. And sure. that was it got it ended up being spoofed on saturday night live so <laughs> not they just spoofed a, a company doing a show backwards right right after we opened that and it began with all the characters dead on stage and all the text was taken from Macbeth, but we just basically did the scenes in reverse order and the lines line by line in reverse order and if somebody said like um i must go now they would they would you would enter and say i must go now and then <laughs> say, hello you would exit and people would pull swords out of each other and jump back to life and it, as a concept it was I, i'm very proud of it i'm proud of the script the initial production was how should i say this very loud <laughs> <laughs> less activity and uh um Pare it down a bit, but that was sort of my thing when I was younger. Was just loud and fast and more, yeah. right? So Bigger, like, better, louder, faster, more, right? Yes, exactly. Right, the the old the old motto. But uh, so that's and you started that in the House of Candles. That was at the time in the early nineties in uh, the Lower East Side. There was a hotbed of activity with. Uh, burgeoning theater groups that were starting and doing uh, some exciting things. And that was one of the places that, that went from being literally a, a candle shop into a, a makeshift performance space. And like so many other places downtown. A props to Aaron Bell, who started NADA and who started many of the Lower East Side theaters and really made that part of the city. It was one of the people who helped make that part of the city what it is today in terms of this little cultural center. Now, you know, I, I think I, as much as I remember and as much as I, I style myself as a historian of sorts of the New York Shakespeare world, I think in my in my memory, I've combined what you were doing and what, what Aaron was doing. I remember that uh, at some point uh, around that time, around the time that, that Christopher was starting Gorilla Rep, uh, that um, also in the Lower East Side, the uh, the group um, Shakespeare in the parking lot started and that was expanded arts at the time and that was Aaron right I think Aaron helped them get spaces Aaron and so Aaron functioned as a producer he was not a director of that company but he like he did with a lot of artists helped them procure space okay all right so so that was that and and that was expanded arts at the time well I'm, so, I'm sorry I, I lost you there for a second Don Clancy was helping a lot of people based on the Lower East Side as well. Right. And, and I, worked, I worked most closely with 
in terms of who helped me get spaces and who helped produce my work, Aaron. And then Chris was, and Gorilla was definitely an artistic, uh, giant artistic influence in terms of doing the shows with Christopher in the park. Right. Yeah. And, and he was, the, uh, Christopher was mostly uh, centered in Washington Square Park, a little bit further west in the, uh, in the, in the uh, you know, in, the, in maybe like Fourth, Fourth Street uh, in, in the middle area over there. Uh, that's and the, you're... That's where we got a lot of visibility. The first show I did with Christopher was uh, Pear Ubu, or he called it Ubu is King, which was in Grand mm -hmm. Central Station. And that mm -hmm. got a lot of press because they tried to shut him down The, the play begins, basically, if you know Ubu is King, the, 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 one of the sort of first plays of what, you know, we now consider avant-garde theater. It begins with the character in French saying Merdre, which is like the word shit, but with R-E at the end. So right. the opening play was shit -ra. And then <laughs> he also turns playing Ubu. I was the first Ubu. And, I, and, he had, and Christopher had filled the giant soap bottle with brown paint and water. <laughs> oh, I would take a, a giant paint shit on the floor. <laughs> prior, prior to when I was in the production, Christopher had done a, a previous production and that had been shut down, I think by Grand Central Station. And Chris turned it into a big sort of um, free speech case and they ended up having to let us do it. And <laughs> doing that role at first. And the very first time we did it, it was like taking this massive psychic shit in Grand Central Station, you know, a hundred... It was very liberating. It was really, it was really, <laughs> right. uh, it was really fun. Was pushing, fun. pushing the boundaries, pushing the limits of what is uh, acceptable culturally. Uh, so, yes. so and then I, go Downey, ahead. I see Don Downey's name on here, and Don and I worked together a lot. And I, Don also did some work in Aaron Spaces, and I think he did a, a different production of Ubu where he had audience members reading some of the lines, he would hand out lines to us. So there was a lot of experimentation going on back then. So yeah, there, there was a lot happening and, and you took your, your company, the Full Real Theater Company, and you started to do some really, really just very different kind of things. I remember two of the things that I remember that you did that were just really very different is at one point you had uh, some kind of Shakespeare, I don't remember what Shakespeare production it was, but you had some kind of Shakespeare on a ship somewhere on one of the piers on the west side. Uh, what was what was that production all about? Remind me. So I mean, I, I like to think of For Real as being one of a large, uh, or not a large, but a group of companies who sort of were pioneering what we call modern immersive theater. Uh, and I think of the Donkey Show comes to mind, and my show comes to mind. There's a bunch of other shows that were doing similar stuff. And the show that you're talking about was on the Tall Ship Peking at South Street Seaport, and that right. was in Shakespeare's haunted house. And that, again, was similar to Hetebkam, Macbeth backwards, in that, but instead of taking one Shakespeare play and cutting it up into pieces and sewing it back together again, we took 12 different scripts <laughs> and cut them all together to tell the story of Shakespeare's most famous characters coming back from the dead as ghosts trying to kill Shakespeare. And it, 8% of it is, is Shakespearean text. There's one or two lines. We had to kind of slip in there of modern text. And that was a... It was sort of a meeting ground between amusement park aesthetics and uh, we were trying to really mix high and low art. So it was like amusement park aesthetics mixed with uh, Shakespeare. So we were trying to take Shakespeare and sort of make it accessible to a broad audience. Well, yeah, and that, that's really, you know, the, that concept of the... Uh the deconstruction of Shakespeare and, and taking it apart and stitching it back together and, you know, adding a little bit of a modern twist and, and making, you know, one uh, section of text from one play inform something from that. That's, that all became part of the avant-garde movement that, that came in the next 10 or 15 years. I think you guys were one of the ones that, that were pretty innovative uh, in, in getting that started in the early 90s or mid 90s. Or I think maybe it was even in the late 90s at that point in the, in the Lower East Side and the Shakespeare scene. You know, there. everything coming. Uh, and then, so that, go ahead, go ahead. You know, look, everything comes from something. We, there were definitely earlier companies mm -hmm. that had done kind of, but it, I hadn't seen anybody do it to the extent that we did with just taking scripts and cutting them into pieces and reworking the text. I had seen people do kind of devised work with other texts but the sort of quilt, the patchwork mm -hmm. quilt thing we did. But, but I, I don't think 
I we, we definitely advanced the football, I think, in terms of that. I really feel like my company, Folio, uh, I'm very proud of the work we did back then in terms of um, so, that. So the performance that was on the ship, that later became the, the haunted house. Because I remember the haunted house was in another, another location. And that was, that was like a, a full-on, uh, like a multi-story location that you went into one floor and, and you kind of worked your way through. It was kind of, kind of like what they have with Sleep No More right now. Uh, where you worked your way through and you had, you know, different characters would come in and you'd interact with them. It was that kind of like immersive, interactive kind of uh, that thing. So that was the, the evolution of the, the ship concept, right? Yes. The first time we did Shakespeare's Haunted House was in 1996. And we first did it as a haunted house. The ship came later. We did it at the Clemente Soto Velez Center, which is, I think, near the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, and we just turned the whole space into a haunted house. And instead of walking through a haunted house, you would walk through a haunted house, but it was inhabited by Shakespeare's characters using Shakespearean text. And there was a lot of direct interaction with audience and with cast members. And the show ran all in all about over the course of 10 years, but it was seasonal. It would run in October, sometimes into November. And we did it on the Tall Ship King. We did it in Central Park at Belvedere Castle for five years in a row. We got some very nice funding from the Central Park Conservancy. They really helped us with that. And we did it with an organization called Shishama with Anita Durst and Shishama. We did it on 42nd Street and Anita was a gigantic patron of ours. And that was really fun doing it on 42nd Street. And yes, you described it really aptly, which is you're kind of walking from room to room and uh, meeting these ghosts of Shakespeare. And in the end, what happened is all the characters kill, the characters are all pissed off at Shakespeare because they're tired <laughs> night after night on stages around the world. So they try to, <laughs> they all kill Shakespeare in the way they died. So um, Juliet, uh, Juliet says, oh, happy dagger, here is thy sheath. There rust and let him die. And stab Shakespeare. <laughs> and then, of course, are A2 Brute. And then they all think they've killed him and they try and escape the haunted house, but they can't. And he comes back to <laughs> trying to, and then we sort of took the Shakespearean theme of part of what success is in the Shakespearean world is kind of coming to grips with your natural circumstances, the circumstances of your culture, of the place you exist, and embracing them and thriving in them and not sort of fighting the system, but sort of um, embracing it. Right. Right, right, right. Okay, and, and this, this, this is a heady concept and something that was very you know, innovative, pushing the boundaries. And I think all these years later, maybe 20 years later, 25 years later, you, uh, I think you were mentioning that you are turning this now into a film script? Yes. I'm working right now on a TV show with this producer named Barry Mendel, which is completely non-Shakespeare related. And Barry's a super busy guy, so I'll send him uh, our edits and stuff like that. And while I wait for him to get back to me, because he has a bunch of pro projects and his notes are amazing. But while I'm waiting to hear from him, in the interim, what I do is I'm taking Shakespeare's Haunted House and turning that into a screenplay. And so far, it only exists on paper. So there's no funding for it yet. But I feel pretty confident it's going to happen. It's going to be very different, though, because the original production, one of the things that, like, like Sleep No More, um, which happened a little later on, it has right. the thing of action happening simultaneously in different places at the same time. So mm -hmm. each member sees the same show. And you can't really do that with film. Right. The, it's going to be it's going to emphasize the story a little bit more and be a more of a straightforward narrative and have less of that theatrical uh immersive quality that uh the original haunted house okay That's, and we'll see what happens and and in between all of that between you know the past and the present with the haunted house and everything else that you've been doing with fall real uh you have done a ton of work with christopher carter sanderson rep you've been uh, their their resident bottom i think for many years with their annual production of a midsummer night's dream yeah i think i think yes, we're both I hitting a, a little bit of a patch go ahead, so go ahead. i'm gonna talk and you, I'll, I'll talk and you can hear me i worked with christopher starting i think i think ubu was in either 93 or 92 i think it was 92 or 93 and I've worked on and off with Christopher since that time. And for a while, I was really, uh, the company was very central in my life and I was very central, I think, to the company for a good 10 years. And 
then Christopher and I went our ways for a bit of time and then came back together. And, and we've had a really productive working relationship going on now um, almost 30 years now that I think about it. It's really, it's hard, it's hard to imagine because as you know, Rodney, from doing theater, you get so into it, it, it feels like yesterday. Probably. Yeah, absolutely. All, all the stuff we're talking about, I feel like it was just like a couple of weeks ago. But and it's, I, it's 25 years ago already. And working with Christopher was always very good for me. And I think it was very, we both really benefited from it. He kind of gave me these vehicles, not, not me, but he provided vehicles to a bunch of actors where I could really do what I liked to do, which was really just immerse myself as an actor in a play and then really engage directly with an audience in a way that was not, in a way that was not sort of pre-planned or just the same each night, but was really, and, and when, we say, when you say interaction, people think, oh, you're saying, hi, how are you tonight? Can I get a suggestion for uh, a type of theater like improv? And it wasn't like that. We were doing the exact same text each night. So it was a tech from Midsummer's, but somebody would be drinking, a, you know, a, a beer and you'd walk over and take it out of their hand and <laughs> you'd do the, in the scene. Or somebody, you know, there was a phone in Washington Square Park at the time, an emergency phone, and I'd pull it off the hook and start talking. Or sometimes I would get <laughs> with he kept, but one or, once or twice one of the shows, I actually hailed the taxi and got into that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always kind of trying to push, Christopher was kind of like, you know, go for it. And I would always kind of try and push the boundaries. And then I think, um, and he really provided these vehicles for that to happen. And simultaneously, I would go back, you know, a few years later and see somebody doing a bit. And I'd be like, that's my shtick. <laughs> <laughs> so so think, now you guys are collaborating again. Uh, just about a year or so ago, during the height of the, the coronavirus pandemic, he did his film version of Macbeth, which was all shot on iPhone. And you appeared in there, I believe. Uh, and now you are appearing in the second one of the, the those so-called so iPhone uh, films that he's doing, and, and that is Hamlet, and that's coming out, uh, I think, in about a month or so. Yeah, Chris, I mean, I have to give props to Chris. He's, he's, he's an innovator. Chris has really come up with stuff that I've, you know, so we talk about Shakespeare in the parking lot. For me, it was really, I like Shakespeare in the parking lot. I love him, but I really kind of saw Christopher first, and then I saw a bunch of other companies. And he didn't, Christopher didn't invent street theater. He done in Renaissance Italy, it was being done in other places, but he really honed a real New York sort of style of it that I've seen other companies in the past 20 years sort of borrowing elements from. And again, right. none of us invented the wheel. We just... Uh, just push, push it forward. One of, one of the things Christopher has done, done recently is doing these film versions of Shakespeare plays, but he's having the act... Because of COVID, he had the actors shoot their parts as sort of just a series of you do your only your lines without any cue or anything and you'd mm -hmm. shoot the whole thing on your iphone and then right. you send tricks and he edits the whole thing together and now what where chris is and that's innovative in and of itself and the extra innovation is i remember even before covid a good couple of years back chris was saying i want to shoot a phone uh, a film made for the iphone made specifically to watch shakespeare on the iphone so, you know, rather than sort of like bashing his head against the wall, like a lot of artists and being like, oh, the, the iPhone, the cell phone is, is destroying this. He's like, no, embrace it. And, right. And right. Forward. And, and I'm very uh, eagerly looking forward to seeing what the, the Hamlet that's coming in about a month or so is going to look like. And I look forward to what, what, what role are you playing in that production? I am playing all of the players in the play within the play. Uh, <laughs> I think a series of puppets. <laughs> Face, I'm holding the puppets, and one of his strong points is cast. You know, then, then I, I, this might sound like tooting my own horn since cast me, but in general, Chris is very good not only at casting the right actors, but casting the right actors for the right role because that right. is far from the biggest role in the play, but mm -hmm. it really is the right role for me. I'm really getting to do what I like <laughs> play a lot of goofy characters and, and bring some clowning to it. Like the gentleman playing Hamlet is, is just outstanding. Yeah, I've seen some of his work. Henry Austin, Chicago. He's he's yeah. really something else, and a, and the nicest guy you could imagine. So right. All right. Well, well, Mark. Listen, I I look forward to seeing the Hamlet with you and with Gorilla Rep. I look forward to seeing what comes up next from uh, Full Real Theater and from you with the television series that you're working on. And in general, I look forward to seeing more of your work here. Always a pleasure to to watch. You're very animated and you're very excited to watch. And it's always a pleasure just to, to see someone who's been around the scene as long as you have. So thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Thank have you. Have a wonderful night. Okay, so we will ask uh, 
We'll say farewell to Mark Greenfield, uh, one of the, the long-running uh, veterans of the New York scene, 